Hi, I'm Perry Stanley, and this is a vintage 1965 Epiphone Casino. Welcome back to another episode of Gear There and Everywhere. I am Ryan, and I'm here with Michael, Sam, Dom, and Paul. And today we have a special guest, Perry Stanley, who has quite a collection and some expertise in uh, Beatles gear, uh, not only in name, but also in book. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we just want to talk about all the things Perry's got going on and his channel and then see, uh, I don't know, what tales of gathering Beatles gear uh, he's got for us. So thanks no for problem. coming along today. Thanks for having me, guys. I love watching your your podcast and uh I was on once before, so it's really cool to be uh, on again with you guys. Do you want to tell us, you guys, Perry, what like got you into collecting Beatles gear? It feels like you, you've been amassing this collection forever, but it must have started somewhere, right? 2001. Um, how's that for specificity? Uh, Greg Fio was a guy on Beaker Cavern who had one of the largest Hofner collections ever. He was in magazines. Unfortunately, he lost all of it in a fire in California. And um, almost all of them, except for the one that his father gave him, a 64 um, 501, um, basically perished in the fire. And um, he had some amazing stuff. And I'm like, wow, that's got to be like a $20,000 guitar. That's got to be, how, how do people do this, you know? And um, so that, that year... Just after after 9-11, it was in December that I bought my first vintage guitar. I was living in Hoboken, and I was um, on eBay, and there's this amazing, gorgeous condition, 1964 Tennessean. And I really wanted the Tennessean. I don't know what it was about it, but I just, I just thought, wow, that would be a really great guitar to start with. And it was really, at that time, it was expensive. I think I paid uh, 28 for it, um, but it was in such good condition. And um, I said, I've got to get that guitar. And I, I bought it. And then I posted on Beat Gear that, hey, I bought this guitar. And they're like, no, you didn't. I'm like, yeah, I did. Uh, they, would, they didn't believe me at first, which is weird. But that's, you know, that's the way things go. Anyway, um, that was my first guitar. And I was absolutely thrilled when I got it because it played so beautifully. It was everything I thought um, a Gretsch wouldn't be. It was, uh, it played really smoothly, it had great action. I could set it up the way I wanted it. I always thought Gretsch's were these horrible things that, you know, were clunkers that didn't play. But the Tennessean is really a great guitar. And you said that was $2,800 in 2001? Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Now you can get them for, uh, you know, two grand. It's amazing. I don't know why that people, it's not a very popular guitar except for Beatle people. But, um, you know, I know, Paul, you have a 64 as well, right? Yeah, I got a 64. I got it years and years ago. And yeah, same thing. Even today, you know, you can, I, I, like 3,500, 3,200 for a really clean example, it seems like, with the case and everything. Yeah, I, I mine has the the burgundy um, the burgundy color to it, so it's it's really great. And then I flipped over the um, on top of the pickups, they've got that card with the the painted uh, silk screen logo. And some guy was selling logos like stickers or something that you could put on. So I literally flipped the card, put these new logos on it. It looks brand new, and I didn't ruin the guitar. I still have the original logos underneath, but you'd never know. They look so good. Well, that's cool. So you started with the Tenny in 2001. How yeah. many Beatles guitars would you say you have now? I have every single one except for, well, I don't have, I'm not interested in the in the early ones, like, you know, in the Stu Sutcliffe days. I, I'm not interested in those. I'm interested in the ones that the Beatles recorded with. My favorite um, album is Rubber Soul. And so that's really what I was going after when I wanted to get vintage guitars. But I don't have um, George's first good guitar, the Gretsch uh, Duo Dude. Jet. And event eventually, you know, they have um, good reissues of that. And, and then you can also get a, a real one. They're not in terms of, you know, when I say they're not expensive, I know what, you know, 
things are expensive these days. I'm talking about, you know, $3,000 as compared to a J160 that, that I saw that it's in Long Island for $26,000, you know. Um, that's Pocket an expensive. Change. It's nothing. Yeah, not for me, <laughs> you know. That. Yeah, well, I, I can't. Um, but, but, you know, and I have a 62, um, but I didn't pay anywhere near that. I actually paid 4800 for mine, believe it or not. Wow. Which That's pretty good. by today's standards is really good because for the most part I had seen them anywhere from seven to fourteen. Now I have to say seven to twenty six. Yeah, mine was mine's a fifty seven and mine was like a little over five thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So Ryan, just I, to kinda oh I'm sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. I was gonna ask Perry if that's so that's the duo jet's the only one that you you don't own as far as recording. I think so. I think so. I mean, you know, name a guitar and I'll tell you whether I have it. I, yeah, I, we can I think show I that have picture them. that you have of all your stuff. That's yes, a you can do that. Picture. Sure. Yeah. Just so that the fans and listeners can have a sense for how incredible this collection is. <laughs> yeah. So what was the, uh, so you said you started this in 2001. What was the, like, obviously we all do videos and things now. Like, was there anyone doing anything like that? I guess there's Rob Taylor, but I don't actually know when he started making videos of those things and those, i guess he was selling those as dvds right yeah um so that's all there was and i'm not that's not who i am i, I mean i don't like to give guitar lessons um I, I i'll do it every now and then and um you know i did that in high school i made extra money by giving guitar lessons to to my peers um but there was nothing like you know Michael Sokol hadn't even come out yet, and Michael Sokol was what the earliest dude on the on the net doing Beatles. It was really just because of my admiration for the Beatles that I wanted to be able to make the same sounds for my own original music. That's all it really was. I have so much admiration for the sounds on the record. I don't care about any photo that doesn't have anything to do with the instruments or the recording studio. I don't care about the photos of the Beatles in Central Park. I don't care about any of that stuff. Show me them Agreed. with the instruments, you know? Agreed, I, yeah. I want to see them recording. I want to see them making those sounds and how they did it, how they mic'd it. And you guys are the same. That's why we we all are in this little club because we all have that desire to see, how did you do that? How did you get that sound? Oh, Even down to the strings. That. Ryan, I see he's looking at naked pictures of John and Yoko all the time, so I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Two Virgins is his favorite album, yeah. Oh, One thing I did want to ask you, Perry, I noticed you don't have a Rick 425 yet. I'm not interested in that guitar. Really? I, I mean, yeah, it might be sacri sacrilegious, but, um, you know, it's sort of like when, when I first came on, and you guys were talking about AC100s, and I know Paul's an AC100 guy, and he's got um, really good examples of it. It never really interests me to have that amp, because for me, recording, it, it just wasn't as practical as having an AC30 for me. I've got three AC30s. I'm starting to change my mind now, because it's starting to appeal to me a little bit more than when, when you guys talked about the AC100. Um, the problem is they're so rare, and I don't want to buy a one that isn't really up to spec, or, you know, you could get... There's one now for sale, but it's like, it's not really original and it doesn't, has like a 66 head on it. And that's not the head that I would want to get if I was going to get an AC100. I want to get what the Beatles used. I mean, that's always the goal, isn't it? You know, to, to you get what you can that's close to it. So I, I, I don't mind buying reissues. I have a casino revolution um, because what are you going to do? Carve down uh, 65 and I'm not going to do that if somebody else does it I'll buy it off them but I'm not going to ruin a piece of vintage equipment um, so most of my stuff slowly I get the vintage gear and replace the reissue gear that I could afford at first and I sell that reissue gear to help me afford the vintage gear so I, at one point I had my biggest my biggest purchase at one point was my 65 casino and I actually had the John Lennon uh, 1965 reissue casino, the one that's made in Japan and Tirada and, uh, you know, has the all the candy and stuff, not the Chinese one. And um, it was a great guitar. It was a really good guitar. I really loved it. But then I had an opportunity to buy a real 65, and um, I had them both at the same time. So what I did was... I documented it. I took pictures of all of them together from the backs, the, the heels, everything, so that someday I could compare them if I needed to. It actually came in handy. And um, 
because I did that in my in my 65 casino video. Um, and then I sold it. Why do I need, um, you know, a reissue if I've got the real thing for that? I've It's kind of ironic because now I have... I have four casinos, I guess. I have a 1964, which looks like George. You saw that in my last video with the 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 U.S. Um, Selmer Bixby. Um, that was a real steal, I think, because I got it for six grand, and it had the Bixby wow. on it, which was I thought that was a good price because they could they could go. For, I paid at the time a long time ago, maybe 20 years ago. I bought that. First 65 for $8,000. That was a lot of money for me, $8,000 for a guitar. I mean, I I had a, I told this to Michael. I had to look around the room and say, I'm gonna, I want this guitar more than that drum set. I want it more than that amp. And I sold all that stuff just to get the Holy Grail. And um, so I, I naturally sold the reissue. And uh, if you want something bad enough, if something means that much to you, you're just going to find a way to do it. You're going to say, okay, maybe I'll go into debt for a little bit, but then I'll have this guitar and I'll get out of debt. You know, and I did. I, I used the plastic through the eyeballs for a while. Um, and and I don't recommend that. But sometimes you make your dreams come true because you grit your teeth. And, and there are times I didn't buy something. And I go, what was I thinking? I had one chance in a lifetime yeah, this happened with the same guy. I, I bought all the, you know, the Beetle Gear book stuff that you guys are talking about that you wanted to see. I've got it from the same person. He, um, he had contact with the guy who was selling his collection. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And I just had the money for it at that moment. And um, he said, oh, you want to buy this? I'm like, yeah. You want to buy this? Yeah. You want to buy this? Yeah. And because they, I never get that opportunity again. I did pass up some things. I passed up a magical mystery tour J160 that was painted, mm -hmm. that was in the book as well. Um, I didn't need that. Um, no the one, one that really that. hurts. It's a the one paint that really job. hurts. Yeah, the one that really hurts. I think the paint job's cool. One, the one that really hurts is um, I could have had a 62 with McCartney specs. And I passed it up. I didn't even ask how much it was. I passed it up because I had bought so much stuff and I said, I want to stay married. You know, I, <laughs> there's only so much you could do at a particular moment. And I just bought a boatload of stuff. And I'm glad I did because I have it now and I'm fine financially and all that. But uh, I do regret not buying that one. I, I, you know, and then something happened sort of serendipitous. Uh, I had the ability to get a reissue, a very, very rare Japanese reissue of Paul McCartney's. It's beautiful. And so it, it's just like McCartney's, except of course it doesn't have the Selmer. And if I find a Selmer Bixby, I'm going to put it on it. But it's, it's you know, this isn't the the new ones with the backwards parallelograms. This is the way it should be. And. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that they only made like 60 of them. Some, some, um, someone uh, uh, told me online uh, who lives in Japan told me that they only made like 60 of them. And uh, I had an opportunity to buy it and I saw it and I said, if I don't buy it, somebody else is going to certainly. And that's the bottom line. So I bought it and I used it right away in a video in the oh. UL 730 video. So what's the most, go ahead, Ryan, sorry. I was just curious around you mentioned like getting a lot of this stuff uh, from one guy. What do you know around what time that was? Like what year that was that you got all that stuff? Um, I posted them on Instagram pretty quickly. Uh, it was only like a year ago. Oh, okay. The, I wasn't. Uh, sure I had a lot of a while ago or not. I think I had I a know. lot of stuff before that. But uh, California Dreaming, that's who he is yep. on Reverb, yep. and and. Um, he hasn't been putting much up lately. Real nice guy, Dave is his name. And, um, you know, he had all this stuff. And I was like, wow. I, you know, when am I ever going to get this again that are in the book? I thought, you know, to me, I don't buy them for this reason, but I justify it. They're like stocks, except better. Because you're probably not going to lose your money on them because their Beatle fans are going to continue. If they've gone this long, they're going to continue. And when you have the right ears and you have the right specs, um, and it's been in a book about the instruments, that's a pretty good investment, I think. Um, because you can always say, well, this appeared in this book, and I can prove it because you could match it up you know, to the wood grain and everything else. Um, 
So, so that's part of the reason why I, I sort of splurged and did it because um, it's easier to, to get rid of this stuff because of the Beatles tag on it. That's the other thing. So if I were to die, my kids would have a little work to do, go on Reverb, find out how much something would be worth. But they could always say this appeared in a book. You know, I made a list of all the years and the guitars that I have so they could identify them. I thought you were going to add us to your will. I thought that was a condition of coming on the show. What happened there? <laughs> I couldn't do it. I had to put my kids first. Sorry. Well, man. Uh, you correct me. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure if you guys would know. I believe those same guitars also appeared on the Beatles Gear website, which Andy Bibu was also a part of. So, yeah, uh, I didn't know that. Uh, I think his name is Babiuk. I, yeah. I didn't know that. I I didn't know that that. Um, and yes, the answer is I'm sure it was because my J160 was one of the original ones that were on the website. And then he found another one that he liked better and took it off. But before he did, I took a picture of my casino on that website. Not my casino, my J160. So I actually have proof that it was on that website. And um, the same, that guy sold it to me. And um, he offered me about three J160s that were 62s. Two of them were really dogs. Like they were just botched. And this one had a crack in the back and that was it. And it turned out a little bit more than that because one of the braces was replaced, the back brace. Um, but other than that, the guitar is perfect. It plays perfect. And, um, you know, they must have taken the back off to work on the braces. I could kind of tell. I don't care. I got a 62, man. Who's, who's, who else has got one? Cracked or not, right? So, um, you know, and to get it for 4800 bucks, it's ridiculous when you look at, you know, they're... They're selling them now for twenty six thousand dollars. So just it's for crazy. context, didn't uh, I can't remember the specific number. Paul maybe knows what what was the how many of those did they make in sixty two? Was it it was only like one fifty or two hundred or something like that? Super low number, even yeah. less. Good I think I, it was like one thirty six or something. Okay, like one thirty seven yeah. maybe. That, Good that, thing I posted it to my Instagram. Let's see yeah. right here, one thirty four. Wow. Yeah. And you had the opportunity to buy three of them. <laughs> Yeah, but the the other two were really they they weren't they were ugly. They I were just like think about so, like the fact that like three were in the same spot, you know, that far well, after manufacturing is crazy. Yeah, well, they were in the same spot because someone found them for me and then wanted to get rid of them because he found the one that he wanted for his website apparently, and um, he wanted to just unload them. And so, for instance, Paul just said that he put in. Um, a ceramic in his J160. I totally relate to that. I've done the same. Um, when he, when I got the 62, he had like one of those. It wasn't plastic. It's that other material. I don't know what you call tusk. it. Yes, that's right. The tusk, and um, it sounded horrible compared to the the ceramic. So I bought a ceramic. I said, I've got a real 62. Why would I keep that in there? And I took it out, and I had to go on reverb and. Um, I paid a hundred bucks too, like, you know, maybe even 125, but it had all the hardware with it. I didn't need all the hardware. Came in handy later on um, because those those screws can break, and um, that's what happened with my uh, J200. I was adjusting the bridge on the 68 to J200, and the screw um, broke, and so I had to go under and, and get the screw out from the bottom. But I had another one, so it was fine. Terry, so, could you um, list just all the guitars from the Beatles gearbook that you own? Because I yeah. feel like it would be cool if we put up pictures afterwards in the edit. Well, I could do this, too. So this one was not in it, but this one is an actual 1964 that somebody stripped, and um, they didn't put the drawing on, thank God, because I wouldn't want that. Um, and they already had moved the pickup, too which I think is really cool because then, I, you know, I don't have a, a problem worrying about, you know, making holes in the guitar. They already did that for me. So I moved the pickup. It didn't come that way. It came with the screw holes in it, but it didn't have the pickup there. So that that's one I got from the same seller, right? Hold on. Give me a second. I'll show you the others. Sam, what's your cat doing? I don't know. She's just, she wants to be in the room. And then if the door is closed, uh, she just won't settle down. This is the 68 J200, and it's really interesting 
because it's a beautiful sounding guitar, plays really well now. Just the, the, the pickup pipe. It's a real nice guitar, but it's heavy. It's really heavy, and it's got this weird metal brace in the middle of it that they were doing at the time. And I actually like the modern one much better. I have a 2000 mm. and the modern one plays, I can play my best on that. This one, the neck is really thin, just like you thought it would be. Um, but the, the sound, because it's so heavy um, and it's a really well-made guitar and it's a beautiful guitar, don't get me wrong, but if you told me I had to record with this one or the modern one, I would take the modern one. Easy, hands down. Do you think George Harrison's also had the really thin neck? Because my 66 J160 has an incredibly thin neck. I'm wondering this, is, this is incredibly thin, too. This really is. And I like thin necks. This might be a little bit too much for me. <laughs> you know, um, I enjoy a little bit of wider neck, 11 and 16s, right? Um, but this one is, yeah. And the other thing I thought was interesting, there's a picture of Harrison with the truss rod cover half off. So he must have been adjusting it. I don't think a screw popped out. I think he was adjusting it. I had to adjust this so that I could get the action just right. And of course, you know, look at all the metal on that bridge. Too pneumatic. You know, you got that metal bridge thing going on with the, um, with the uh, ivory, not the ivory, the the plastic uh, bridge pieces there, whatever you the call them. Burst is fantastic on it. This is a, this is the one that appears in the book, and it is an absolutely beautiful guitar. It really is. This is the uh, the other thing I got. I showed. So hey, this is ooh. the the lap steel. That, um, that John used, not the actual one, but the same model, same year. This was in the book as well. It's got the red felt behind it, it's pretty cool. Look at the pickup, it's a Hofner pickup. <laughs> you know, the staple pickup, just like on a Hofner. That was from the book, that's in the book. Um, the Texan I have, I have two Texans now. Let me just, I gotta secure these guitars so they don't fall. This is the Epiphone Texan that I have. And we can tell he listens to the American version of the albums. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, You're I absolutely right. right. See the plastic bridge on it? That's pretty cool. Just like that, McCartney's. Is that the one that I use, Perry, or was it the other one? Is you use the other one, okay? And I like I like the neck on the one that you played better. This has got a slightly chubbier neck. I was surprised. I thought it was going to be the same, and I picked up like, oh, okay. <laughs> I can play it, but the other one I'm so used to playing. Um, but it has a changed bridge on the other one. This is all original, so it's cool to have. I'm not going to sell the other one because somebody put um, a plug so I can go electric with it and. It's, I've recorded with it, you know, so I have both. I have one that's got the plastic bridge and the other. And that's so a 64? Fine. Yeah, 64. This is 64. What's that? Is that the one that's in the book? It is. Wow. You, you know how you can tell? Look at this stain here. Hmm. You'll see that in the book. And Perry, um... Also, too, it's... I'm sorry, uh, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, exactly. You better be sorry. <laughs> so it's cool too that um perry has both texans because now of course paul has the newer one too uh newer one what am i talking about like, you should have just talked anyways michael paul has uh, an updated bridge he went to the fixed standard you know drop in bridge on his as well so it's cool that perry has both versions who sold him the yeah. texan you said you were gonna yeah perry while we're on the texan before we move away didn't somebody well known sell you the Texan I played, but it has a good backstory, right? Yeah, uh, the one that you played, I bought in um, Stuyvesant Town in New York City from a guy um, who used to hang out with um, Lou Reed and his name, I'm trying to think of his name now. Um, 
it's in the case because I, I have his um, autograph. He had a he had a he had a uh, slight hit in the '80s with a remake of '96 Tears, and um, I can't the name escapes me right now. Um, Put but, you on the spot. Yes. That's on me. No, that's okay. Um, I'll look it up. Yeah, me too. Yeah, he he was. Um, it was interesting to go into his apartment, and um, it was Halloween when I bought it, and his, he was all pissed off because his daughter was. Um, dressing up as Britney Spears. <laughs> was it uh, Garland it? Jeffries? Garland Jeffries. That's the guy. Very good. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, the interesting thing about Garland was real nice guy and everything. I'm in his apartment, and um, he he's like, I never really got the Beatles. And I'm like, okay, I I can't let this guy know that I'm a Beatle fanatic. You know, I'm like, okay, you know, I just I saw the guitar. My wife was with me. I saw the guitar. He opened up the case, and it was like, I swear, Sunbeam shot out of the case. Ah, this is a 64 Texan. Oh, my God. I'm going to buy it. And I got it for $1,800. Oh. <laughs> it had a change bridge. I asked him about it. He said, I don't want to talk about that. It's you either want it or you don't. I'm like, I, I think I want it. <laughs> and uh, and I got it for $1,800. You basically and it was stole cool. it. For that price. Well, so so he had it on eBay, but he had the most horrible, horrible, tiny picture of the guitar that was grainy and you really couldn't see it. And something just told me, you got to look into that. And I did. And he said, well, you can come and see it if you want to. And I'm like, doing? Okay. I'll die. So we went into New York City because I lived in Hoboken, just took the train across and uh, had a nice dinner with my wife. And... Um, it was just an amazing experience. And he's like, do you want me to sign the guitar? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want it signed. Um, but uh, I had like this check that I was going to give. And of course he wouldn't accept checks. So I, you know, um, made the check invalid and I had him sign it on the back of that. So I have a signature, you know, and I keep that in the case. It's kind of cool. Um, cause it tells me the date and everything. I know it was Halloween. Um, it might've been Halloween 2001. Might've been 2001 or 2002. I thought that the, now the, the it had to be 2002 because the first guitar I bought was the, um, Tennessean in December of 20, 2001. How are you going about like finding these people to buy stuff from at that time? <sighs> That's a really good question. Um, well that was eBay. Everything was eBay. Um, at the time there was no reverb um, if there was I didn't know about it and um, I did a lot of eBay transactions never really got burned I got really lucky because I just I went by the the score of the person and stuff like that um, and everything was eBay um, and I just I still to this day I you know now I'm retired so I don't have to I don't have to work anymore I worked 32 and a half years as a high school English teacher believe it or not and um, now I'm staying up till four o'clock in the morning, scanning reverb. I still do that. Not even, even though I have everything, I just like to look at the candy. You know, I really it's do. It's an addiction. I just, yep. It's, it's, yeah, it's we all totally do. an addiction. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and I keep pictures of guitars. I, I know that you do that because you mentioned that when we, uh, we had our first conversation. I have folders of all the guitars, and I keep the pictures of them. And if I see a really great example, even though I didn't buy it, I want a picture of it. And and it's amazing. The coolest thing that happened to me, I did tell this to Michael, um, was that 10 years before I got my 65 Casino, I saw somebody post a picture of it. They had just bought it 10 years before I got it. And um, Finkley was this guy's name. That was his name on the Internet at Beak Ear Cavern. And I'm like, oh, my God, he's got a 65, yada, yada, yada. Ten years later, the exact same guitar came to me, and I knew that was meant for me. And I had pictures of it already. Isn't that amazing? That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so, so this is the nanny there. This is the, the – I have two hoot nannies, as you know. One of them is going to be sold um, eventually. Um, but this is, uh, this is the one that's actually in Beatles gear. And, it and plays is this really the well. same one that Michael used? No. No, this is a different one. I don't know whether you can't really see me, right? 
plays really well. us had gotten to play one can you tell us a bit what it's like to actually hold it and play it yeah so um this one has particularly pretty good action i'll just see if i could show it close it's not really high um it's a little weird because it's such a long um a long across the fret that you know when you're doing bar chords your finger here has to press a little harder because it's a little longer but it's not hard to push down that's the difference. And it's pretty clear. It's a yeah. yeah. This it's one like plays... a small scale length or something. Yeah. This one plays better, Michael, than the one that you play, believe it or not. No way. Yeah. We yeah. always it make jokes about, about uh, hootenannies because like they're supposedly constructed poorly or something right what's dumb maybe well, they, they've, about this. they've got they've got that scarf joint here that you know a lot of people don't know about that i don't know whether you can it shows up here but oh if yeah you look, i can see it mm -hmm. yeah so that scarf joint is just the way they made it it's not a broken guitar and when i did my video i pointed that out um with the other one um but they're not bolt-on they, they went to bolt-on later on this is a set neck and uh they, you can still date them now, um, and they're pretty easy to date. They still have a website you can do that. But it's just so cool when you see one exists because, um, again, before Reverb, there was only eBay, and I bought mine for my first one I bought for 75 bucks, but it had oh, no gosh. hardware. <laughs> it had no hardware, not a thing on it, but it was a hoot nanny. It had the right... It had the right circle. It had the pick guard on it with the screws. It just didn't have the bridge. It didn't have the tailpiece. And it didn't have the tuners or the nut. So I literally, because I'm a nut, I went around and I bought um, the same years of guitars on eBay that had the parts I wanted. The hardest part was to get the square tailpiece because all the rest of the tailpieces were the kind of Y one. And that, so I basically Frankensteined um, the guitar put it all together found out that the neck was um bent so it wasn't going to play that well and they said well we could fix it if we shave the neck and i'm like i don't i don't want to do that so i took off the neck had it taken off rather and um i had another 1964 that i had bought with the right neck and i had them take that neck and put it on the hoot nanny and i kept the original neck so if i ever want to sell it they can have the original neck and um it's a perfect guitar. It plays perfectly, and it's a hoot nanny. It's a yeah, real hoot We'll throw hootenanny. a link to that video in the description to this because that's one of your finest videos. Seeing how you got all the parts, put that guitar together. Um, guys, Perry also took me to school when I visited him because how do you all pronounce the company that makes the hoot nanny? Framus. I assume it's Framus. Framus. No, you're right. Like I, I said Framus, and Perry looked at me like I have three heads. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's Framus. I had no idea. Somebody oh. in my one of my my uh, Hofner video, somebody said, "Why can't you pronounce Hofner right?" And I and I know where he was going. I must have been German. I said, "Well, the only people I've ever heard say Hofner or whatever you want because he had the Umschlau thing in it <laughs> um, is the the only people I've ever heard pronounce it that way are Germans. Even McCartney calls it a Hofner." You know, well, that's good. let's all right, this this whole thing. All right, this is gonna get me going because this is so a subject for me on how to pronounce stuff. You know, like I mean. Uh -huh. Everybody, all right, we'll keep moving on. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, Paul. I want to hear what you had to no, say. I was just going to say, like, you know, people in England, they say, like, book. But I say yeah. book. So who's right and who's wrong? You know, like, I have a thousand Massachusetts towns around me that nobody can pronounce. But I'm not going to bash anybody about it because I really don't care how you pronounce it. I know what you're talking about. You know, at the end of the day, it's just a language. When you suck into pronunciation, that just lets me know that you're just a poor sap. And you're just a useless human being. Like, you know, now, the one that does... Stuff. Why don't you give stuff. some context, Paul, to where this is coming from? What correction oh, like was Glasgow, made to you? Glasgow, yeah. Glasgow. Like, yeah. I, you know, like, I made a few videos in the past where people really, like, strings. I guess the way I say string or strings. I don't know how else to say it. Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't go see a speech therapist and all this other stuff. Like, <laughs> 
it still kind of grates on me when people, people say like Ricky Bacher too. That's what I was about to yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. I can't. It's... I can't say Bacher for some reason. I, just, I, 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 I say both. I think I say both. Rick and Bacher. Yeah, Rick and Bacher is what I usually say, not Rick and Bacher. It's See, it's Bacher, a tricky one because that one's that one's actually kind of confusing because the family was German, but they came to America and like Americanized the name, so they changed the spelling. So once they changed the spelling, it should have been pronounced Backer. Ben Hall says it's Backer. Right. But originally yeah. they would have been Bacher. Yeah. <laughs> right. Bacher. I think so. And but the popcorn yeah, no. is red and Bacher, which is even more confusing. <laughs> if if Roger McGuinn says Rick and Backer, then it's Rick and Backer. But the, I guess with the point to my story, too, is at the end of the day, I know you're talking about the beautiful guitar. So it's like, it doesn't matter who says what. And that's what yeah. makes me mad about it all. It doesn't matter. Call it the hell you want. The John and Lenny guitar thingy. You know you know what you're talking about. So, so Perry, so since with, you have... With, just before we go on to this one, because you were talking about Framus, um, I, I'm just curious, uh, have you ever played any of the ones that have like a pickup in it that like, came stock like that? Like maybe the no. Camping King or the other one? No, you haven't? No, I, I do have a Camping King, but um, it doesn't have a pickup in it. I'm just so confused. This is I can cut this out if I need to. But uh, I've always been so confused because... I've I have two examples of videos from the '60s where they have, um, they have the pickup and they have a, the tone and volume knob, but one of the knobs goes through the pick guard, and I'm just so baffled by that, like why it would be designed that way. So, anyway, some 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 goofy guy just said, "Let's put it here." I just want to find someone King... that's actually played one of those. <laughs> How do you think the Camping King stacks up against the Hoot and Annie? Oh, I think it's a great guitar, um, honestly, because uh, the only difference is it's a little brighter because it's all maple back and sides, and um, it it's it sounds just like a hootenanny. <coughs> it really does. It sounds it records beautifully. Um, it's just a little bit brighter because you've got the maple back and sides. That's what I got. I got a uh, Sunburst uh, Camping King. That's that's what I have. Uh, I have a Sunburst, and they're beautiful Sunbursts mm -hmm. too. I think they're gorgeous guitars. But uh, they, they sound very, very much like a hoot nanny. Again, this one is in the book. And if you notice um, that it's actually got the uh, the strap mm, thing. That's cool. It's on the bottom because they they um, they wanted to make it like McCartney for the book. Mm, so when awesome. they shot it, they put it in there. So I didn't take it out. You can still see like the... They, they refinished it. I don't know what they can really tell, but they, they refinished over where they, it used to be. And um, this isn't a real 64. It's a custom shop that's supposed to be like a 64, and it's um, distressed a little bit, not too much, but it's the one that you see in the book. And I was really surprised. I've never played one of these before. I'm not really a telly guy, and um, I, I plugged it in. This thing rips like... This pickup just is all you need. It really is a great sound. And when you flick it over to the bass side, you know, it, it does something to the pickup um, and gives you like a, a bass pickup too. But man, this guitar screams. Absolutely, this is like one of my favorite sounds. I couldn't believe how good it was when I, when I plugged it in. I was like, holy crap, this guitar rocks. So for the layperson fan, that was almost certainly used on Pepper. And um, what, good, good morning, morning, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so some people say that the solo in Sgt. Pepper that opens up the song, -na 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 -na, that's yeah. this. And uh, I, I I, did try it through a Conqueror, and it sounded just like it. So people, because of the photo, have said that they think it's through the Selmer, and you have a Selmer and the Conqueror, and you said you don't think the Selmer sounds mm -hmm. as good as the Conqueror does for that, right? You know, the, it's, it's really interesting. When people don't have the equipment, they make a lot of guesses. And myths start to be created. Can you still hear me? You want to go over there? Myths yeah. start to be created. And, and there's a lot of myths. And people are angry when you tell them that's not really, I got the equipment. And that's not really the way it's going down. And um, it's, it's just this, we built these beetle myths. And we all kind of buy into it. I know that I, I have this picture in my mind of who was playing what on certain, certain songs. Um, but when you've got the equipment, sometimes... That's just not the case. There, it just you know. So you were talking about um, which idea now? The the idea the of Selmer versus the Conqueror for the Sergeant. So the Selmer, lead. the Selmer is not a screaming, distorting amp. 
it is a very clean, it's kind of like a Fender Twin. It's like the European version of a Fender Twin, except I think it's more versatile in some ways than a Twin because those push buttons really do um, affect different sounds. I'm, I'll eventually do a video on it. But, um, you know, when I did uh, uh, my Getting Better and I used the Strat, um, there are pictures of that amp around at that time. Um, and I... I tried it. I said, let's try what see what the Strat, you know, some people think it's a casino, whatever you think it is, is fine. But I plugged it into the Selmer and it was perfect because it was clean. It had the right tone and you can change the clean tone very easily by pushing those buttons. Um, it's not an amp that you distort. It just doesn't really, takes forever like a twin to distort, you mm -hmm. know. I thought it had a, like a fuzz circuit in it. Is now, it a Thunderbird or no? It's the Thunderbird Mark II, just like McCartney had. It doesn't mm. have a fuzz circuit. Do you think that they're I, worth buying, like, as a Beatles fan? Because obviously, like, I, we don't I, even know if they're really on anything, except maybe maybe, maybe getting better, like you said. You, you're going to kill me. I have two of them. Oh. I have two of and them. And you want to give so, one to me? Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, House eventually. Housewarming gift. <laughs> there you go. They're, they're, one's going to be sold. So the what happened was um, I bought one. That was, I was overcharged for it, but it had the the stand, that the very rare stand that the amp is on. So when you see McCartney or the Beatle pictures, it's there's a special stand with white wheels that the Selmer's on. I have that. Um, the first one I bought didn't have the stand, and it had slightly different push buttons, thinner push buttons, and the other ones got thicker. These are the things that we care about. No one else gives mm -hmm. a shit. But um, the the push buttons, like the one McCartney has, were on one and not on the other. But one had the screen, and the other one, they wanted it. They really wanted a Fender Twin, but it was too expensive in the 60s for them to get it. So the guy told me the story uh, when he sold it to me. He said, so what he did was he, he got the gray plain. He got the gray plain. Fender twin kind of look and put it on the Selmer. There's the other Selmer. That's funny. You see how it's like a Fender twin? Yeah, it looks because like Because they a were, twin. They, they wanted it to look like a Fender twin. And that one has, um, I bought that one from Sweden. And they only charged me like two grand for it. It wasn't like, you know, some of this stuff. But the other one cost me a lot of money. I got it from this guy in Denmark. And... Um, uh, but I got the wheels and the stand with it, and it all, also had the right push buttons. So I took the screen off of that one and put it on that one, and now I've got a perfect Selma ramp. That's cool. Wow. Perry, yep. I just uh, have Beatles gearbook open by chance. Is this your Texan? Yeah, look for the stain. You see the stain on the side? A angle it yet. down a little bit, Sam. Can you see oh, you that? can't miss the stain. Wasn't the stain oh. on the top near the pick guard? No, I thought it was on the... Further back, maybe? I thought he belly. had it flipped over, so it Is would have it? been on the Sorry, other side. Sorry, I've got to pin myself here. Do you no, see the, the stain... wood grain stuff there? The stain is on the top. If you're So if you're flipping it over, it's going to be uh -huh. on the bottom. The stain is... Oh, okay. Well, I have the old book, so I don't know if that's... Oh, no. I'll grab the new book, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. No, I got to... Let's see. Are there any from the this? I have like the two thousand one book. Are there any of yours in here? Well, they're mostly the same pictures, I would assume. So if you go to the J two hundred, they didn't change it. Cause yeah, I know that the revised version has more stuff. Like I couldn't find the Esquire in mine. Yeah, they. The, oh really? It's a smaller picture. Go to where the Esquire. I can find it. Hold on, I'll get the book. What? Uh, I don't even know where that. Would be. Find yeah, all I yeah. saw was a uh, an ad for a 60s Fender Telecaster. Um, yeah, it's a smaller picture that they used. Hold on. Hmm. It's like a side picture. That was, uh, what, 67? Yeah, oh, here it is. That, here you go. We're all showing our books off. <laughs> yeah, right I there. don't see the J200 in mine. Oh, I see. Yeah, the one that you're showing. Yeah, I can see that black thing. Let me, let me yeah. Look. It's here, look at my Freaking. video. Here we go. Yeah. I got it. See? I got it first. Yeah, I, I have it too now. <laughs> I won. All got it. <laughs> In mine, I only have this at little ad. Yeah, there it is. But it's so you don't have about that. that? There's yeah. there's the there's the Esquire in the book. Mm. And then uh, the J two hundred 
is a big double plate spread. Yeah, I don't have that, a lot of these in mine. My original one, for some reason. They didn't have the Framus in the original one, but the Framus that they have now is the one that I have. For the average what? listener, this is Beatles Gear by Andy Babuik. Is that how he settled on saying? Babuik. I, I, I say Babuik. I say Babuik. You're probably yeah, right. Yeah, so my um, original copy only has this J200 in it. Really? It's, yeah. it's been updated. Sam, what does the cover times. of yours look like? This is, uh, I think, 2001. Yeah, that's, yeah, the that's why. Because mm -hmm. John's uh, J160 hadn't been discovered yet at that point, right? Uh, I have. Yeah. I, uh, Here's the frame. Yeah, yeah. no, his isn't in that book. Yours doesn't yeah. have the discovered J160. Because ours it's, has, uh, like, John's Page 438 and 439 in the new one. What years? What's on those pages? Oh, the J. Four thirty-eight and four thirty-nine. Yeah. Is that the J two hundred? Yeah. Yeah. Perry, do you have any other Beetle uh, gear guitars? <laughs> so the 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 five oh, the, the five the, book, you know. oh, okay. the five that are in the book are the the lap steel, the uh, Esquire, the J two hundred, the Texan, and the Framus. Framus, okay. So we dare our viewers to have more than five from the book. That's a challenge. <laughs> I'm just happy to have the book. Yeah. <laughs> the well, best I would say it, de it definitely, I mean, and let alone your amps and everything else you have. I mean, geez, we've been going at this thing for a while now so far in this episode. And, I mean, we'll only scratch the surface. It's just your your collection really is incredible, what you have. I want to buy you Thanks. Frames. I, I, that 62 that Hoffner up. right there. Oh, man. This like is the 63. 63. You saw the video on this. Yeah. It's a 63. I got it from this guy um, at Gun. Uh, it's a weird name, like uh, Gun Cotton Guitars, in England, and um, this guy always has Hofners in stock. He's got one right now. It's a '63, um, and he's really knowledgeable. He's a really nice guy. When I bought it, you know, he said, "I'll oh, give me a call." So I was speaking to him for about an hour in England, and. Um, he also has the, the right J160 straps. He has them made and stuff, and so he threw one of those in for me. Um, real nice guy. How many um, of those Hoffners have you owned? Or, like, I'm just saying, like, reissues or that. I, I'm curious how many you've played, so, like, maybe you'd have an idea, like, what the best one for the money is. Well, actually, um, the first one I had had a little bit of a higher action. It was the, the 4060... I guess it was called the 4050 or 4060. I can't remember. It was from um, the guy who wound up being kind of a crook. Um, Nick Thiel? Nick Thiel? Okay. No, not Boxer. him. That's another guy. Um, <laughs> another criminal. <laughs> no, this guy, um, Music Ground. Music Ground. My first one I bought in the um, early 2000s or 90s, late 90s, and from Music Ground. And they were doing this promo of uh, 20 years or something like that. 2060 I don't know what the whole thing was but um it had a it was supposed to be an exact one like Paul's but they really screwed it up because they didn't have the right information at the time it was a fat neck like a cavern bass but it was Paul's but man did that thing sound good it wasn't the easiest to play because it had a little bit of a higher action and what happened was I just kept on adjusting the truss rod adjusting the truss rod and finally you know I think it just popped through the wood or something I still have it it's a wall hanger now. It doesn't play. But it had a really great, fantastic tone um, because it had the fat neck. It had a lot of sustain, and it was really warm. And then I had the, the uh, I bought the, um, the next one I bought was the, uh, the one that I did the video on in the comparison. And that's a really good bass. They make really good reissues. The, the German ones, you think the German reissues are best for your money, you would say, maybe? I can't really say that with any authority because I haven't played um, the ones that are less money. I haven't played okay. them. I you just, haven't missed I just, anything. Yeah. Well, you know, look, you, if you can play guitar, you can play guitar. You can make a cheap guitar sound great if you're a good player. So, yeah. it, you know, it's all, it's all relative. Yeah, I, uh, I told this story on the Cavern Bass episode about I've had two contemporary basses basically my entire adult life. I've loved them. They play fine. They sound great. But I didn't know what a real Hofner was till I visited you. And once I started playing the plunky sound with the low action, I was like, oh, 
this is a Hofner base. Yeah. Um, I had the same feeling with your casino. Like I've had the um, Korean 2002 casino. That's all I had at the time. And I was yeah. perfectly pleased with the action, the tone, how it looks. Then I played your 64 casino and I was like, the 65 oh, you played. 65. And I was like, oh, this is a casino. Like the difference between the vintage stuff, the good reissues and the cheaper reissues is just night and day. Yeah, I, I liked the Korea Casino. I had one too. I had one with the red sunburst kind of thing going on, the vintage cherry, I think they call it. And um, it was a good guitar. The pickups didn't sound anything like a real casino to me, but I liked the sound of them. And, um, you know, whatever you did, you know, you knocked it out of the park. Like you, your, your stuff on something. I, when I first saw your video on something, I was like, oh my God, he got the drums literally like exactly like the record. It was so well done. <laughs> it doesn't we should really all matter say if nice you had all about me. We should just keep going with compliments <laughs> to me. Let's keep it going. I don't think anybody's going to have a problem. No. You know, Perry, actually, I, I want to oh, go ahead, Ryan. Oh. Sorry. I would love to try your casino through my AC100 because I've been trying to record the another girl lead just to get the mm. tone right. And I'm like so close, but it just doesn't have the right grit from the pickups or something. Like, hmm. it feels like I need to roll up the tone. Or like it like feels like I need to roll up the volume knob higher than it can go just what to get it a little bit have? more distorted. I have the uh, inspired by John Lennon model, so the it's one you I know. Have. Yeah. yeah, Dom got it incredibly close. I actually used Perry's sixty five on mine, but I fucked up. I was doing I was trying to switch the pickup selector back and forth to match different tones, but it was just the uh, bridge pickup. And Dom dude, you were freaking me close. out. You were freaking me out when you did that track, when I was watching you do that, because it was the first time I could actually hear somebody playing my guitar and my amp back to me, and you were nailing it. I was like, oh my God, it's so cool when you have the right equipment, you can hear somebody who knows what they're doing, nailing that lead. It was so fun to watch that. Yeah, that was one I, uh, of the best things you said too, was, you know, we can spend all the time in the world trying to EQ the guitars we have or mess with the sound to get the right sound. But when you have the right tool, it's obvious right away. Yeah, that's, yeah. I think we were using the Pianet at the time. Um, yeah, you have all the right tools. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, And it makes it so much easier to get that sound that you're looking for. Um, you can enhance it when you put on um, some of the plugins. It definitely, like the bass guitar, um, definitely when you put on an RS-124 compressor, it definitely adds a Beatle element to oh, it. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Oh, yeah. But if you, don't have the, if you don't have the right guitar and the right bass to start with, it's much, it's much harder. But you know what? Um, the, the amp that you use, you've been very successful at getting those sounds. So, you know, it's, it is what it is. I just find it, for me, I feel very blessed and lucky um, that I get to... to I have to, I feel like I got to earn these things. Like I, I'm in a position where I have these things, but I really have to, I have to earn them in that I have to show people I really can play. That's one thing. I don't want to come across as some, you know, rich dude because I'm not, who's a collector and and just holds on to instruments and don't doesn't play them. I'm a musician first and foremost, and it's really important that people see that about me that I'm not just some dude who keeps all these guitars. And just, then. Yeah, I, yeah. I like to show the love of them. I like to show the sound of them and share it. You know, I know what it's like to to yearn for that guitar. I've yearned for every single one of these. Someone wrote on the J160 video, "Oh man, I want that. I want that guitar so badly." And I wrote, "So did I." You know, I did. It was that's why I did everything I could to get it. You know, I have that same feeling. I keep them in the cases. I take really good care of them. And when I open it up. The sun still comes out. Oh, it's just, it really is. You you still get that feeling, and I feel like I'm 13 when I'm recording with these instruments. It's so cool. Yeah, that's that's one of the coolest things about you. Is I remember I was about to do help, and you took out the Framus, and I just remember first of all being in awe of it because I hadn't really played one before. But also I was a bit worried because when John's playing help, first of all, he's playing the shit out of it, but he also physically slams the guitar. Slaps it. Yeah. yeah, while boom, the drum boom, yeah. Boom. Well during the guitar riff. And I actually asked you, like, is this is this okay? <laughs> like it might break your guitar. And you were like, these, these aren't meant to be in their cases, they're meant to be played. I think you actually yeah. said that. That's yeah. such a cool attitude from someone who has all of these uh, pieces of gear. That's a great yeah, I think it's important to, to, to perpetuate the Beatles through the sounds that they made. And when you have the instruments, 
I, I feel it's really cool to be able to share it with people who are interested. Not everybody's interested, but you know, I'm, it's it's slow building my audience because I'm not I'm not doing. I think the typical thing. I'm not giving lessons. I'm not doing back to back covers all the time like you are. I'm doing little snippets to sort of demonstrate, and then I want to talk about the stuff, and I'm not sure there's really that audience that is really cares enough. I'm still finding that out. You know, when I did the UL 730. I really just wanted to talk about paperback writer, like, you know, what I did to get that sound. And I wasn't sure anybody was going to give a damn. Um, but I took the chance anyhow. And it still hasn't been like an incredible video. It's only got like, I don't know, 3,000 views or something like that. I'm surprised. Well, everyone go check that one out. <laughs> if you're watching. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to ask you about since we've been talking about guitars for a while, but we just pivoted to uh, you guys talking about uh, mixing a little bit. Uh, you have a red desk, is that right? All right, so, oh, you get to see something no one gets to see. This is like the child that I am. I still have G.I. Joes, because <laughs> they keep me in my childhood. There's a guy up there with the sharks, and, uh... So this is what I really look at when I'm working on my music and stuff like that. Picture my mom and dad. Yeah, Gumby. Uh, yeah, Gumby. Gumby and Pokey <laughs> and the Bat Boat. That's my dad there who looks like Clark Gable. Um, I made an, an album cover for him because in 1942, he actually made a recording in Brooklyn of his, quote, band, which was like a big band. So this is the Beatle gear that I have for my recording. So uh, starting at the top, you've got the TG. This is the Curve Bender. And this is the Zener Limiter. And so this is really great for crushing snares um, like the later Beatles. I've got two Red 47s. And so these are the preamps I always run through when I'm using, uh, when I'm doing the Beatle thing. Um, this is a real uh, Channel Limited 127, but the truth is the plug is so good. I use the plug quite often. Can um, you uh, give us a little bit more like info on like what those are for people who don't know? Cause I, I think I sort of barely know what they are. Uh, oh, and okay. like, are those like, what year are those from and things like that? Well, these are, these are um, licensed, um, licensed kit from Abbey Road. Um, Chandler Limited, um, the builder uh, somewhere in the Midwest, um, makes a lot of reproductions of the gear that Abbey Road actually uses now. They have all this gear in the studio. I know I was there. And um, so they have uh, Red 47 reproductions, which are the like the, the board preamps uh, that were used in the Red 51 board. And this is like the uh, modified Altec the RS-124, that EMI, you couldn't get this stuff for the longest time because they were just um, modified things by EMI and built by EMI. And now Chandler actually makes them and uh, they're licensed by Abbey Road and they actually use this stuff. So this is very close to what the Beatles would have used. It doesn't look exactly like it, but it works exactly like it. And um, it's really cool. This is the TG2. So this would have been the preamps they used on Abbey Road. And this is the Zener limiter. This would have been like um, the compressor. They have the TG1 is actually more closely related to um, a replica of the uh, compressor that they use. But then they did that and then some for modern recording. And that's the Zener. Um, so this is great when you want to crush a snare and get that real white album snare sound. And then this is just a, like a uh, surgical EQ, uh, just an amazing EQ. And then over here, um, if you look down here, these are the red. The red thing is actually another red 47. Before Chandler came out, there was a guy who was building them on a website and putting the schematics out there. So I have three of these: one, two, and then there's another one. So I actually have five red 47 um, preamps. And then this here is another hand-built thing. This is exactly the schematics of the red 51 desk. So you've got the, the two controls for, um, for EQ here, and I've got stereo. And um, it's very simple, but it really does sound like the plug-in, or the plug-in really sounds like this, either way you put it. It's pretty amazing. And then this here is like two red RS-124 compressors. Uh, they came out with it. It's called Retro uh, Revolver. And so they have their version. By the way, this is also a version of RS-124. It was the first one to come out before Chandler did his. It's made by Leeson Grove, and it's it's called the uh, 
124 too, the R, I can't read it right now because I'm blind and I need glasses. But <laughs> that's another version of RS-124. And, um, you know, all of that, the rest is all modern stuff, my patch bay and uh, some Neve there and some 80s and this is API uh, EQs and stuff like that. I've got an LA-3A, I've got an LA-2A. Oh, here's a piece of Beatles kit. Claire has this too, of course, because he's got a professional recording studio. That's a Fairchild replica called the Unfair Child. And that's yeah, really he told cool us about video. that recently. Yeah, Claire's, Claire's the man. Um, I watched him kind of grow up, and um, he's living the dream that I always wanted to live, um, but didn't. And um, everything I, I thought about, you know, what it would be like to have a studio, um, because I love recording. Um, he's, you know, he, it was interesting in his interview, he was saying, yeah, it's not everything is cracked up to be because it's hard. It's very hard to, to do that. Um, <laughs> so so uh, that's, that's a, a really cool piece of gear. And, um, you know, I've, I watched Clay when he was 15 years old on Be Gear Cavern. Um, getting his first guitar and everything. And it was really exciting to see a kid who went to the cavern itself and played there and a uh, very talented guy. He does a really cool thing. In one of his videos, he was showing, I use the mutes. I engage the mutes when I do the, the Beatles. He actually can mute it from behind the thing and play like that, which is pretty incredible. And he gets a great sound. He did um, A Day in the Life, and he did all the muting with his own palm. And I was like, wow, that's really cool, you know, to be able to do that. End of part one, intermission. <laughs>